who was Augusta Conte. Isadora Marie Augusta Francois Xavier Conte. 1798-1857, was famous and influential in his day as a sociologist, and even coined the word sociology. He was the first Western sociologist. Kant has also endured as the founder of positivism. Kant taught mathematics for a while at Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, where he himself was educated. Although mental illness to the extent of psychotic episodes that required hospitalization interfered with his work. His condition stabilized enough for him to complete his major work during a marriage that ended in divorce. After the woman he loved in a subsequent platonic relationship died. He formulated his mission to create a new religion of humanity. Kant published Cours de Philosophie Positive. Course in Positive Philosophy, in six volumes from 1830 to 1832. How are psychology and philosophy related? Up until the 19th century, no clear distinction was made between philosophy of mind and psychology. The science of psychology did not yet exist in its own right until the early 20th century. Early historical figures in the science of psychology, such as Sigmund Freud, 1856-1939, are of interest to philosophers because their theories of the human mind changed ideas about human nature in ways that philosophers had to take into account. What are the pitfalls and promises of experimental philosophy? In its degenerate forms, experimental philosophy could resemble philosophy by opinion poll. But that is not its goal or method. Rather, the view is that before relying on ordinary intuitions, philosophers should check what non-philosophers actually believe. That is, if philosophical theories depend on a certain view of intuitions. Then philosophers should begin with the empirically accurate view. They should make sure that when they say the public thinks X, that the public does think X. The promise of philosophy is that experimental philosophy has the potential to make social and political philosophy more scientific. This does not deprive philosophers of the freedom to construct theories that explain why ordinary intuitions are incorrect. Insofar as they are complex judgments and not mere expressions of taste. Recent work in experimental philosophy includes, Joshua Nob and Sean Nichols. Experimental Philosophy, 2008, Joshua Nob, Intentional Action in Folk Psychology An Experimental Investigation, in Philosophical Psychology, 16, 2003, and K. Anthony Appiah, Experiments in Ethics, 2008 Critical responses to experimental philosophy include, Ernest Sosa. Experimental philosophy and philosophical intuition, in philosophical studies. 
132, 2006, Kirk Ludwig, The Epistemology of Thought Experiments, 1st vs. 3rd Person Approaches, in Midwest Studies in Philosophy, 31, 2007, and Anticopinon. The Rise and Fall of Experimental Philosophy, in Philosophical Explorations, 10, 2007. What did George Berkeley think of matter, extension? And other mainstays secured by René Descartes and refined by John Locke? According to Berkeley, matter and extension. The main property of matter that was supposed to be its occupation of space were abstract, general ideas. Which is to say that the words naming or describing them did not refer to real ideas. Since only ideas, minds, and God exist. Matter and extension did not exist for Berkeley there was nothing real corresponding to them. Berkeley applied the same criticism to our presumptive ideas of causation and the distinction between primary and secondary qualities. He looked for the ideas of sense or imagination to back them up, and found none. In the case of causation, Berkeley was basically an occasionalist. Who was Ludwig Wittgenstein? Ludwig Wittgenstein, 1889-1951, had two distinct philosophical periods. First, was his ambitious development of logical atomism that was influenced by his teacher Bertrand Russell. 1872-1970, resulting in his writing Tractatus Logico-Philosophicus, 1921. Second was Wittgenstein's original, ordinary language theory of philoso -phy. This was an original insight about ordinary language. Wittgenstein was unquestionably a genius. What was the Enlightenment? The Enlightenment was known to its contemporaries and future generations as the Age of Reason. The Enlightenment went beyond intellectual activity to affect painting, literature, architecture, religion, the sciences, and, of course, politics. Culminating in the American Revolution, 1775-1783, and the French Revolution, 1789-1799. While there were common Enlightenment intellectual themes, conditions in different nations produced distinctive types of thought, also, there was a marked development of ideas from the first half of the 1700s to the second half. Principally because of the major social and political changes preceding and accompanying the American and French revolutions. What did Descartes mean by clear and distinct ideas?
Descartes thought that there was a natural light of reason by which one could be sure of one's thoughts. Descartes wrote in his Principles of Philosophy, 1644. I term that clear which is present and apparent to an attentive mind, in the same way that we see objects clearly when being present to the regarding eye, they operate upon it with sufficient strength. But the distinct is that which is so precise and different from all other objects that it contains within itself nothing but what is clear. In other words, the thinker has an intuitive or direct experience of clarity and about what he or she is clear about. Descartes was relying on our ability to recognize when we know something for sure in all its detail. For what is Lucirigari most famous? The publication of Irigares. 1932, Doctoral Thesis, Speculum of the Other Woman. 1974, led to her expulsion from further study at Lakin's Freudian School at Vincennes. In Europe a PhD is not sufficient for university teaching. As it is in the United States, and a second dissertation or habilitation is required. Ira Gary's dissertation consisted of her theoretical analyses of a lecture by Sigmund Freud. 1856 to 1939, on femininity and long quotations from the works of male philosophers, from Plato. C 428 C 348 BCE, to Hegel, 1770 to 1831. It was evident in the work that by a speculum, she was referring to the concave mirrored medical instrument inserted into a woman's body. Who was Jeremy Bentham? Jeremy Bentham, 1748 to 1832 was the founder of the moral system of utilitarianism, which is considered to be one of the three major systems of ethics in Western philosophy. Along with Aristotelian virtue ethics and Kantian deontology, or duty ethics, What were the main themes and claims in classic African-American literature? Until the Emancipation Proclamation, 1862, the main issue was the abolition of black slavery. From the end of the Civil War until the Civil Rights Movement of the late 1950s that resulted in legislation against discrimination in 1964, the issue was discrimination against blacks and their social and legal exclusion from opportunities in employment, education on all levels, housing, adequate medical care, and fairness in the criminal justice system. At the same time, support for and construction of positive Identities for African Americans was a central concern. What were Voltaire's main contributions to philosophy?
in his letters concerning the English nation, 1734, published as part of his philosophical letters. Voltaire introduced a French audience to the ideas of John Locke, 1632-1704, and Isaac Newton, 1643-1727. At the same time, he offered political criticism of the ancient regime, which was to motivate the French Revolution. Against Blaise Pascal, 1623-1662, who in the previous century had counseled quietism and claimed that suffering on earth was excellent preparation for heaven. Voltaire argued for the betterment of human life in the here and now. Voltaire's letter on Mr. Locke in his Philosophical Dictionary took up a possibility raised by Locke of matter being able to think. However, later in life, he retreated to a skeptical position on such materialism after it was taken up by the philosophes in defense of atheism. How did Mary Estelle's life affect her written work? Estelle was unmarried and spent much of her adult life in a community of women with similar backgrounds in London. She is famous for having said, the whole world is a single lady's family. But she never openly condemned the subordination of women in marriage because she herself believed in charitable service and the unselfish roles of women in family life. Her main objection to the nature of marriage at her time was that men chose wives mainly for material gain or temporary sexual passion, she wanted husbands and wives to have a bond of friendship. Who were the important philosophers of Middle Stoicism? Middle Stoicism matured in Rhodes, with Painidius, c. 185-110 BCE, and Posidonius, c. 125-50 BCE both of whom influenced the statesman and writer Cicero, 106-43 BCE. Posidonius, c. 125-50 BCE. Incorporated both Platonic and Aristotelian ideas into his views. The main accomplishment of Middle Stoicism was to apply. Greek ideas to military and political life in Roman culture. Middle Stoicism was generally more focused on how those who were Stoics could weather specific life problems, such as defeat in war, or imprisonment. What is non Euclidean geometry? Euclidean geometry depends on a number of axioms, most important of which concerns the property of parallel lines. Non-Euclidean geometry changed Euclidean axioms. It was to have application in physics, particularly Albert Einstein's theory of relativity, when it enabled a concept of the fourth dimension. Carl Friedrich Gauss, 1777 to 1855, 
was the first to figure out the principles of non-Euclidean geometry. Although because he did not publish his ideas. The credit was given to Janos Baliai, 1802-1860, and Nikolai Lobachevsky, 1792-1856, who were working independently. They rejected the Euclidean assumption that could not be proved in which only one line passes through a point in a plane that is parallel to a separate coplanar line. In their new system, a line can have more than one parallel end. The sum of the angles of a triangle may be less than 180 degrees. By the middle of the 19th century, Bernhard Riemann 1826-1866, developed a geometry in which straight lines always meet, thereby having no parallels. And in addition allowing for the sum of the angles of a triangle to be greater than 180 degrees. In Euclidean geometry. Parallel lines never meet and the sum of the angles of a triangle is always 180 degrees. Rayman also went on to distinguish between the unboundedness of space as part of its extent and the infinite measure over which distance could be taken that is related to the curvature of the same space. Riemann returned to Gauss' now published work and explained the new ideas of distance first introduced by Loibakevsky and Bolyai in terms of trigonometry. The bottom line was that arc length could be understood as the shortest distance between two points on a surface, without reference to the geometric properties or applicable geometry of that in which the surface itself was embedded. In 1868, Eugenio Beltrami, 1835-1899, demonstrated a model of a Bolyai type two-dimensional space, inside a planar circle. This proved that the consistency of non-Euclidean geometry depended on the consistency of Euclidean geometry. Thus reassuring skeptics that non-Euclidean geometry was valid. What did the dialogue between the pre-Socratics reveal about their philosophy? The philosophy of the pre-Socratics can be viewed as one big intellectual conversation. We can see the historical development of their ideas and a kind of progress in their thinking over time if we consider them in, more or less, chronological order. A pattern was thus developed as each generation of students carefully examined and criticized the ideas of their teachers, as well as the rivals of their teachers. Ever since the pre-Socratics, philosophers have thought about the ideas of their predecessors and try to perfect or disprove them. Who was Margaret Fuller? Margaret Fuller, 1810-1850, organized weekly Saturday conversations with women in Boston to supplement their education and discuss their condition in society. She co-founded the Dial with Ralph Waldo Emerson, 1803-1882, in 1840, which was the official transcendentalist publication for four years. 
Fuller left the magazine in 1842 to write for the New York Tribune. Fuller interviewed intellectuals for the Tribune in England and Italy in 1846, including George Sand, Thomas Carlyle, and the Italian revolutionary Giovanni Assoli, with whom she fell in love. The couple had a child and married. The entire family drowned in a sea accident while returning to the United States. When their ship hit a sandbar 100 yards away from Fire Island. Fuller's main work is Woman in the 19th Century, 1845. In which she argued for women's independence and equality between the sexes. Her great nephew was the 20th century architect of geodesic domes, Buckminster Fuller. What was Otto Neurath's main philosophical contribution? First, Neurath thought that the only connection between language and reality was metaphorical, and he believed that. At best, language and world coincide only because reality is all previously verified sentences. This required a coherence theory of truth for each individual sentence. A sentence is true if it coheres with already verified sentences. Only the entire language system can be verified. Neurath famously wrote, We are like sailors who on the open sea must reconstruct their ship but are never able to start afresh from the bottom. Where a beam is taken away a new one must at once be put there. And for this the rest of the ship is used as support. In this way, by using the old beams and driftwood the ship can be shaped entirely anew. But only by gradual reconstruction. Second, Neurath did not think that phenomenalism could provide a valid foundation for scientific language because sense data are subjective. His alternative was to propose that mathematical physics be used for objective descriptions. A doctrine known as physicalism. Furthermore, language itself could be described in the language of mathematical physics because it is material. Constituted by sounds and graphic symbols. What is known about Leibniz's life? Gottfried Leibniz, 1646-1716, was born in Leipzig, Germany. His mother was the daughter of a professor, and his father was a professor. His father died when he was. 6. Leibniz studied philosophy and law at the University of Leipzig, but he was too young to be awarded a doctorate in law when he finished at age 20. He then moved to Altdorf, where he graduated and was offered a professorship that he turned down to become secretary of the Rosicrucian Society in Nuremberg. He then entered the service of Johann Philipp von Schönborn, Elector of Mainz. And during this time he did not produce his own philosophy but mainly wrote histories and biographies for pay. In 1672 Leibniz went to Paris. And after four years he entered the service of Johann Friedrich, 
Duke of Hanover. When Johann died, he served Ernst August, 1629-1698, Duke of Hanover, and then George Ludwig. Who became King George I of Great Britain in 1714. He was commissioned by Ernst August to write the History of the House of Brunswick in 1685. After traveling to Munich, Vienna, and Italy, he showed as part of his commissioned writing assignment, how Brunswick was connected with the House of Este. Leibniz had a close correspondence with Ernst August's wife, Sophie, and her daughter, Sophie Charlotte, who became Queen of Prussia. He became president of the Berlin Society of Sciences in the same city where Sophie Charlotte lived. After her death, her family was not welcoming to him. Perhaps because they had resented his relationship with her while she was alive. Leibniz was continually involved in efforts to promote communication and cooperation in scientific research, both theoretical and practical. He also had hopes that all Christians might unite. He was honored with prestigious government posts in Vienna, 1712-1714. But by the time of his death his royal patrons, and most of the intellectuals who had known him, abandoned him. They did so for several reasons, Isaac Newton was favored in Leibniz's dispute with him. Leibniz no longer had the protection of Sophie Charlotte, and his philosophical work was not popular. Neither the Royal Society nor the Berlin Academy saw fit to honor him after he died. King George I was nearby when his funeral was held but did not deign to attend or send a representative. Leibniz's grave remained unmarked for almost 50 years. Until a descendant of Sophie Charlotte took up the cause of rehabilitating his memory. While it is not clear how damaging his dispute with Isaac Newton, 1643 to 1727, over the discovery of the calculus was to his reputation and standing, it evidently proved more harmful to him than it did to Newton. Newton had claimed that Leibniz plagiarized his work on the differential calculus. When Leibniz died, he was engaged in writing a religious work about Chinese philosophy and the leibniz clark correspondence in which he attacked virtually every aspect of Newton's metaphysical system. How and why did Jewish and Islamic philosophy become part of the scholastic tradition? Arabs, Berbers, and other Muslims invaded Christian Spain. In the year 711 as part of their Islamic military campaigns. These military invasions were followed by a kind of colonization, which supported lasting cultural exchange. The Muslims were inclined to tolerate Judaism as well as Christianity because it was also a monotheistic religion of the book. That is, like both Islam and Christianity, Judaism had its own Bible with one God. As a result of the dual tolerance of Jews and Christian by Muslim rulers, the scholastic tradition, which was originally a Christian tradition, came to incorporate both Jewish and Islamic philosophy. What was Hobbes' theory of government in Leviathan?
Hobbes advocated a strong form of monarchy as a way of redescribing the role of the individual in his own politically volatile society. He began with the idea of a state of nature, which was a condition of life without government. Hobbes' method was to determine the uses and justification for government. From that original condition, together with an understanding of human nature. According to Hobbes, human beings in their natural condition are each roughly equal in physical strength. Because the weakest has the ability to kill the strongest. They are not sociable by nature. But rather exist in a prolonged condition in which each individual is against everyone else a condition of war. In fact, humans only seek one another out for their own glory. Greed, or to gang up and conspire against third parties. Without government and the stable organizations and institutions created and supported by government. Life in a state of nature is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Men do have right reason in nature, the first principle of which is to preserve themselves. They are also aware of the laws of nature. The first of which is to do whatever is possible to keep the peace. But to keep the peace, there needs to be an enforceable contract between parties. And after one side has performed there is no guarantee that the other will do his or her part. Hobbes wrote that covenants without the sword, are but words, and of no strength to secure a man at all. Was Immanuel Kant a recluse? Yes. He lived a very precise and orderly life. And his neighbors claimed to be able to set their clocks by his daily walks. During the 1770s, he retreated into what biographers call his silent decade. He set himself the task of figuring out how perception and intellect are connected. Never a bone vivant, he withdrew from even minimal social contact. But he was very forthright about what was going on in his life and did not make the usual social excuses. When a former student tried to coax him out, he responded in this manner. Any change makes me apprehensive, even if it offers the greatest promise of improving my condition. And I am persuaded by this natural instinct of mine that I must take heed if I wish that. The threads which the fates spin so thin and weak in my case to be spun to any length. My great thanks, to my well-wishers and friends, who think so kindly of me as to undertake my welfare. But at the same time a most humble request to protect me in my current condition from any disturbance. What was Ralph Barton Perry's theory of value? Perry wrote that value worked like a target. Any object becomes valuable or acquires value when interest is taken in it. The moral good is the promotion of harmonious happiness. Which is achieved when all interests are harmonized and fulfilled. Was F. 
H. Bradley also an idealist. It's not clear whether Bradley was an idealist. Though he did believe that our direct experience of particular existence is what we can call reality. In his second major work, The Principles of Logic, 1883, Bradley attempted to construct the metaphysical system that would explain his ethics. Thought is embodied in judgments, which must be true or false. Ideas are the contents of judgments and they represent reality. Ideas also represent kinds of things. Each member of which is a particular individual, in the sense of an object. For example, you can have the idea of your particular pet dog, Rover. And that idea represents just Rover, but you also have the idea of dogs that represents all dogs. However, all judgments are hypotheticals claiming that certain universal connections exist in reality. For example, if one makes the judgment that dogs are good companions for humans. One is claiming that dogs in a general sense that applies to all. Dogs are good companions in a general sense that applies to all human beings. But such a judgment is hypothetical because you might have a dog that is not a good companion for you. Reality is the sum total of everything that there is in the world and as such. Reality is what Bradley called a concrete whole. One encounters reality by the experiences that one has. That is, judgments are abstract, whereas reality is particular. For this reason, thought can never fully represent reality. Another way of putting this is that the real world cannot be completely described and classified by us. Finally, in his appearance and reality, 1893. Bradley further explained that reality, as experience, is all blended in harmony. Bradley thought that relations such as bigger, smaller, before, and after our appearances, not reality. Relations are abstracted by thought from direct experience of reality. This direct experience taken altogether is the absolute, and, in a surprising turn, Bradley concluded that the absolute, or the totality of our experience, is the real reality, as opposed to something that our experience could be experience of. In other words, Bradley held both that our experiences are experiences of reality and that all of our experiences added up constitute reality. Who was Ralph Barton Perry? Ralph Barton Perry, 1876-1957, is best known for his theory of value and his realist views. But he received a 1936 Pulitzer Prize for his biography of his mentor and colleague. The Thought and Character of William James, 1935. Perry received his Ph.D. from Harvard in 1899 and taught there from 1902 to 1946. His main publications include a 1925 revision of Alfred Weber's History of Philosophy. The New Realism, 
1912, General Theory of Value, 1926. Puritanism and Democracy, 1944, The Realms of Value, 1954, and The Humanity of Man, 1956. What did Aquinas think about the soul? Although Thomas Aquinas, 1224-1274, carefully and meticulously investigated what was known in general about human senses, intellect, will, and emotions. He believed that the human being is the whole of all these faculties or powers. Simply put, the physical body is the matter or material of a human being. And its form or soul is its substantial form. That the soul can understand general truths and exercise free will proves its non-materiality. The reality of the soul is its spirituality. Because the soul cannot be divided, it cannot be corrupted and is therefore immortal. Furthermore, because the soul cannot be divided, it cannot be the result of biological inheritance but is made directly by God, each time a person is born. This divine intervention at birth gives the biological process of human reproduction a dignity and sanctity that elevates the institution of marriage. What was most important about Aristotle's work? To encourage the development of certain knowledge, Aristotle produced a theory of the rules of correct thought in his development of syllogistics, a form of logic that dominated the field until the modern period. Regarding science, Aristotle's theory of causation was meant to show how things could come into existence and change. Without reliance on Plato's idea of a more real but hidden world. Aristotle, furthermore, advocated and practiced observation and classification in all fields. Aristotle's sense of ethics was also more down to earth than Plato's. He believed that happiness was an appropriate and universal goal for human beings and that it could be attained by developing and practicing virtues, which were inclinations to behave in certain ways. Unlike Plato, Aristotle did not have an idea of a utopian form of government, but rather claimed that government arises naturally from organizations of families, clans, and villages. The purpose of government, according to Aristotle, is to support individual well-being and self-sufficiency. While Aristotle agreed with Plato that the arts were a form of imitation, he showed that they did not necessarily falsify reality, because they could be about universal human truths, rather than mere distorted copies of actual people and events. What is the problem of the criterion as put forth by Montaigne? Montaigne's more theoretical arguments went to the heart of theories of knowledge. All human knowledge comes from sense experience, but all humans perceive things differently. 
and we are all vulnerable to illusions, dreams, and ordinary distortions of perception. On top of these doubts, Montaigne then introduced the problem of the criterion. We need a criterion to determine if our experience is reliable as a basis for knowledge. But the criterion itself needs to be tested and for that a second criterion is necessary. And to test this second criterion, a third one is necessary, and on and on. All theoretical and natural philosophers after Montaigne had to come up with some sort of answer to the skeptical problems he raised. The unreliability of sensory information, the disagreement of experts. Cultural differences in values and customs, individual differences in perception, the possibility of human error. And above all, the necessity for a criterion, or neutral standard to settle disagreements. Has there been much progress in philosophy? Philosophy progresses in two ways. First, philosophical work mirrors the concerns of its historical time. For example, in the 17th century, when modern nations were forming, philosophers like John Locke 1632-1704, and Thomas Hobbes 1588-1679, wrote about the origins of modern, democratic government. In the 20th century, philosophers have applied ethics to new choices made possible by modern medicine. The second form of progress in philosophy consists of the growth of philosophical thought over time. This progression of philosophy is largely a conversation among philosophers, who in one way or another are in dialogue with their historical predecessors, as well as their peers. What was Robert Nozick's own political theory? Nozick, 1938-2002, held that any form of distribution is just if those involved are entitled to what they own. Entitlements concern acquisition and transfer of property, as well as the rectification of prior wrongs and errors. He favored a minimal state that served a policing function, and defended strong private property rights for its citizens. Although when analyzing John Locke's, 1632-1704, idea that private property is based on mixing labor with something. He posed this question. Why does mixing one's labor with something make one the owner of it? If I own a can of tomato juice and spill it in. The sea, do I thereby own the sea? or have I foolishly dissipated my tomato juice? Nozick resolved this puzzle by moving from a metaphysical ground to a utilitarian one. The same way Locke did. We are entitled to what we mix our labor with because the added labor increases the value of the original material. What are Zeno's paradoxes?
Zeno's paradoxes continue to occupy mathematicians and philosophers, today. His paradox of motion applies to any distance. The paradox states that, before you can walk across a room, you have to travel half of the distance, one half, but before that, you must traverse half of that half distance. One fourth, and before that, half of that distance, one eighth, and so on. Because there are an infinite number of divisions of any given distance traveled, it is impossible to go anywhere from anywhere else. Zeno's paradox of Achilles and the tortoise applies a slightly different principle to a race. Suppose that Achilles, in a race with the tortoise, gives the tortoise a head start. Before Achilles can pass the tortoise, he must get to the place where the tortoise has been. But because the tortoise will always have moved on from that place, Achilles will never be able to pass the tortoise. Was Alexius Menung serious about non-existent objects? Yes, and it cost his reputation dearly, because Bertrand Russell 1872-1970, was to make great fun of him for it in his famous article on denoting, 1905. Still, other 20th century philosophers, such as Terence Parsons, 1939, and Roderick Chisholm, 1916-1999, were to defend the consistency of Maynang's. Ontology and the usefulness of being able to talk about non existent objects. Menung believed that non existent objects include the merely possible, as well as the impossible. He thought that existence was just a property of objects, like smell or shape. So that, for example, fictional characters lack that property, while Menung himself had it. Was Diotima of Mantinea a real or fictional female philosopher? Diotima of Mantinea, who is said to have instructed Socrates on love in Plato's Symposium, has been believed to be a fictional invention since the Renaissance. Before then, she was assumed to have been a real person. What is Latin American philosophy? Latin American philosophy is either or both the thought of philosophers who reside in Latin American countries or the newer work of Latino Latina slash Hispanic American philosophers. Like African American and Native American philosophy, it is a subfield to the academic discipline that formed after 1930, although it was not duly recognized until after 1980. Contemporary considerations of philosophy in Latin America written by philosophers who also reflect on the Latino-Latina-slash-Hispanic-American. Experience include the following books, Linda Alcoff and Eduardo Mendieta. Thinking from the Underside of History, Enrique de Sell's Philosophy of Liberation, 2000, Jorge J. E. Gracia, Maria Camurathy, Editors. 
Philosophy and Literature in Latin America, 1989, Jorge J. E. Gracia and Elizabeth Millenzabert. Editors, Latin American Philosophy for the 21st Century, The Human Condition, Values. And the Search for Identity, 1989, Eduardo Mendieta, Global Fragments, Critical Theory, Latin America, and Globalizations. 2007, Susanna Nuxitelli, Latin American Thought, Philosophical Problems and Arguments, 2002. And Ophelia Schutt, Cultural Identity and Social Liberation in Latin American Thought, 1993. What are some key facts about Charles Pierce's career and life? Charles Sanders Pierce, 1839-1914, was born in Cambridge, Massachusetts. His father, Benjamin, was professor of mathematics at Harvard University and a founder of the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey and the Smithsonian Institution. Benjamin Pierce is also said to have built the Harvard Department of Mathematics. At the age of 12, young Charles discovered logic, and at 16, he began his independent study of philosophy. In 1859 he graduated from Harvard, unsure of what I would do in life. His primary interest was in logic, for which there were no career opportunities. He practiced geodesy for several years and returned to Harvard to study natural history and philosophy in 1861. He got a Ph.D. in chemistry in 1863, graduating summa cum laude. Pierce continued his studies of logic on his own and has been considered to be one of the greatest logicians of all times. Although he disagreed with Immanuel Kant's 1724 to 1804, insistence that space was Euclidean and later moved to Friedrich Hegel's 1770 to 1831, objective idealism. Kant remained a dominating influence over his philosophical ideas. Pierce's philosophy was a distinct form of pragmatism, which he called pragmaticism. Who was Isaac Newton? Isaac Newton 1642 to 1727 was one of the greatest scientists and natural philosophers of the western tradition alexander pope wrote his epitaph nature and nature's laws lay hid in sight god said let newton be and all was light newton made coherent mathematically sound sense of the Copernican theory. Kepler's and Tycho Ubra's discover IES, and Galileo's findings. He united terrestrial and celestial mechanics in a comprehensive cosmological system that supported further research for over 300 years. His scientific view of the cosmos included a place for the God of Christians, which was much appreciated in his time. Newton's equations are still useful for calculations of motion in the middle range of medium sized objects close to the surface of Earth. 
Newton's theory is not useful for subatomic particle research and measurements made in light years. How well do old philosophers receive new philosophers? This is, of course, not a matter of the age of philosophers. The old tradition remains robust. And its practitioners have repudiated each of these new philosophies as not real philosophy. Still, as their practitioners secure posts in philosophy departments, which they increasingly do, that dismissal becomes untenable. If someone who has been trained by philosophers publishes work in philosophy journals or books, is hired to teach philosophy, and identifies as a philosopher, that person is as much a philosopher as the bird that waddles, quacks, and swims is a duck. The point is that philosophers customarily disagree and repudiate each other's thoughts when they are among friends. So one would expect no less than this kind of reaction to the new philosophies who have diverged from the mainstream. Did Russell have a humorous side? Although he suffered from depression on and off throughout his life, this did not suppress Russell's wit. As the following quotes show, the whole problem with the world is that fools and fanatics are always so certain of themselves and wiser people so full of doubts. I would never die for my beliefs because I might be wrong. It has been said that man is a rational animal. All my life I have been searching for evidence which could support this. Aristotle maintained that women have fewer teeth than men, although he was twice married. It never occurred to him to verify this statement by examining his wives' mouths. What was Jill Delos like as a person? He did not like to furnish autobiographical information, claiming, academics' lives are seldom interesting. His fingernails were extremely long, but when it was suggested that this was a sign of eccentricity, he replied, I haven't got the normal protective whirls, so that touching anything, especially fabric, causes such irritation that I need long nails to protect them. In the same interview he said that the fact that he did not travel did not mean an absence of inner journeys. Who influenced George Berkeley? According to Berkeley, our ideas of sense are real ideas so long as we perceive them. And in our perception of them, we are doing no more than in some way participating in what God has created. In that way, Berkeley's notion of the world is an expansion of the doctrine of occasionalism. Propounded by Nicholas Malebranche, 1638-1715, in the 17th century.
and brought to an epiphany by Gottfried Leibniz, 1646-1716, through his notion of pre-established harmony. According to that doctrine and Berkeley's embellishment of it, God does all the real work. From which we, because we have been created by him along with the rest of his creation, benefit. Berkeley thus extended the presence of God in human cognition. As something like a force constituting reality itself. Nonetheless, he endures as an empiricist due to his emphasis on sense data as a component. Of knowledge never mind that for Berkeley, sense data were not signs or indications of what philosophers and the vast majority of non-philosophers call an external world, or reality. For Berkeley, sense data were neither real objects in themselves, nor signs of an external world, but ideas, created by God and placed in us. Period. Why is gender an important topic in studies of early modern philosophy? Social and family life, generally, and ideas about the sexes were so different. In the 17th century compared to our own that they should not be. Overlooked as an important background to the beginnings of modern philosophy. Interestingly, all the well-known 17th century philosophers Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, Hobbes, and Locke were bachelors their entire lives. As were the great majority of their colleagues in philosophy and the sciences. That is, should we say that the limits of reason are the limits of human knowledge? Or should we extend the limits of reason into the domain of religious faith and revelation? Strictly speaking, these are questions of how we ought to think about religion. In the Middle Ages, which was the great age of religion. Philosophers were constrained to begin their philosophizing with basic assumptions that God existed and that he was good. But philosophers have always been motivated to push through to the limits of knowledge and seek certainty within those limits. By deploying Aristotle as the personification of philosophy, Maimonides was able to raise necessarily covered questions of whether reason could justify belief in the existence and teachings not only of the Judaic version of God, but also of the Christian, and perhaps Muslim, God. We should remember that such questions, had they not been posed under the cover of the august and unquestionable authority of the philosopher himself namely, Aristotle would have resulted in loss of livelihood. Excommunication, banishment or ostracism from the community of the devout and faithful, and also death itself. Philosophers were not stupid in the great age of religion. Notwithstanding their apparent devotion to varied theological regimes and their leaders, who it just so happened. Controlled all aspects of social, political, and economic life in Europe and the Middle East. At the same time that they upheld specific religious doctrines. What were the common themes of the Enlightenment?
The common themes were a set of values that included the following. Imbuing all other values was the importance of reason and its uses to discover ideal forms of human nature and society. The belief in the natural goodness of man. Which was to be rediscovered by the reform of corrupt institutions. An overall secularity and downplaying of traditional Christian transcendence. A new aesthetic and ethics based on the goodness of nature. Perhaps most important, a great faith in progress or the belief that the present is better than the past and that the future will be better than the present. Nevertheless, none of the paramount Enlightenment thinkers simply played out these themes in direct ways. They almost all used reason or rational thought together. With a fair amount of wit to propound and develop their ideas. The ideas themselves, though, sometimes had unforeseen consequences. That is, often the Enlightenment geniuses went too far, or were not able to fully think things through. As a result, Skepticism, pessimism, and romantic madness took over when the ideas of progress and the ideals of human reason ran out. What are some highlights of Arthur Schopenhauer's life? Educated in Germany, Schopenhauer traveled throughout his childhood to France, Holland, Switzerland, Austria, and England. After his father's death, which biographers attribute to suicide, his mother, Johanna Trawaunner, moved to Weimar and became a celebrated novelist. She introduced Arthur to Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. August Wilhelm Schlegel, and the Brothers Grimm. Schopenhauer studied medicine at the University of Göttingen and philosophy at Berlin. Getting his doctorate at the University of Jena. After that, he lived in Frankfurt. His doctoral dissertation. On the fourfold root of the principle of sufficient reason, 1813, formed the basis of his philosophy, which appeared systematically in his most important work, The World as Will and Representation, 1818. What do Deleuze and Guattar mean by their bizarre terminology? Jill de 1925 to 1995, and Pierre Felix Guattar, 1930 to 1992, took pride in using new terms that they did not define, but which they thought readers would understand. Mutant universes of value seems to refer to new systems of value that are unconventional and popular. Examples in our time would be interests in vampires in entertainment. The growing importance of electronic communication. And the change in household pets from mere pets to members of the families with whom they live. The importance of town hall meetings in the United States would be an example of micropolitics. Schizoanalysis which suggests contradictory meanings, was used to refer to Deleuze and Guattar's project of getting rid of the idea of the Freudian idea of the unconscious as a way of explaining human behavior. 
Becoming woman refers to the fact that contemporary women are actively involved in defining their own social roles. Who was Anne Conway? Anne Conway, 1630 to 1679, was best known in philosophy for her The Principles of the Most Ancient and Modern Philosophy, 1690. This work was meant to overthrow both René Descartes, 1596 to 1650, dualism and that of Henry Moore. 1614 to 1687 She posited an infinite number of ordered monads each one of which was a congealed spirit as the ultimate components of reality She was influenced by Flemish alchemist Franciscus Mercurius van Helmont who showed her work to Gottfried Leibniz 1646 to 1716 Leibniz himself acknowledged her influence and some think he got the term monad from her What was William Wool's fundamental antithesis of knowledge Wuhl claimed that in every act of knowledge there are two opposite elements, which we may call ideas and perceptions. Wuhl was influenced by Immanuel Kant, 1724-1804, and shared Kant's belief that scientific information is not a pure collection of objective facts in the world. But that a prior system of ideas is required to arrive at scientific knowledge. However, he did not go as far as Kant in locating the possibility for scientific knowledge wholly within the mind. That is, unlike Kant, Wuhl thought that the world as it is known to human beings exists independently of human minds. Neither did Wuhl go as far as the empiricists, who emphasized induction and observation, in what he called the sensationalistic school. <laughs>